And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Kareem El Mofti, BDS, MDPH. That's a master's in dental public health. Um, is a practicing dentist. He's from Egypt, but now he is uh, where he was born and raised and graduated from dental school, University of Cairo Faculty School of Dentistry in 2009. He is interested in Egyptian history, e- etymology, farming, and open sea fishing. He believes that the scientific fields behind oral health promotion has matured, giving rise to a range of services to complement dental treatment everywhere. He moved to Canada with his wonderful wife and baby daughter, and they currently live in Burlington, Ontario, outside of Toronto. So his interest now in summer became touring parks, splash pads, and Canada's beautiful nature, and in winter, touring indoor play areas. His clinical training focused on pediatric dentistry, while his master's degree research work in dental public health was testing different oral health education methods. He had brief training in China and California and was part of the team who broke the Guinness uh, world record for the largest oral health promotion session in 2015. He started No Dental in Egypt and traveled around Egypt's deserts, countryside, and metropolis, reaching as many people as he can with his team of No Dental ambassadors. He recently started No Dental in Canada and is restructuring it to better serve his new community while working to obtain his license to practice dentistry. His focus now is to make No Dental available for every dentist to add an edge to their patient care and introduce No Dental methods to scientific community research entry. Uh, interest. So uh, Kareem is my uh, favorite name because uh, if you're, I'm uh, 56 and if you're born in 62, the most awesome man on earth was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who <laughs> played 20 seasons in the NBA for the Milwaukee Bucks and the Los Angeles Lakers. Please tell me your mother and father named you after Kareem Abdul-Jabbar all the way in Cairo, <laughs> Egypt. Is that where the name came from? Well, not really, but I have to thank him. <laughs> I really have to thank him because just carrying his name made me famous everywhere I go. <laughs> oh my God. He was, I mean, if yeah. you thought Michael Jordan was big, I mean, Kareem just owned the NBA. And, oh, yeah. um, and I also, um, like the, I, I wanted to ask you a question because, um, um, yeah. how do you pronounce, I always thought it was funny. The word algorithm came from the inventor, a, a small a L hyphen, where is me? How, how, yeah. do, how do you say it? How do you say it? And how did so in, how did the rest of the uh, Cretans around the world um, get <laughs> from that name to algorithm? How, how do you technically say it? So the real name is Al Khawarizmi. This is how it's said in Arabic. Say it again. Al Khawarizmi. Different and, letters. And so all the rest of the world from China to Europe to North America, they heard algorithms. Yep. <laughs> Isn't that funny how his yeah. name, uh, sh- so should we quit calling it algorithms? Should we start calling it algorithm? Algorithms. <laughs> I think we're used oh. to algorithms by now. Oh, so it was algorithm or. Uh, say- if, if we want to deviation, if we want to do the deviation from the real name, it's going to be like algorithms or something, but this letter doesn't exist, right? It's not easy to say. Well, what's so, amazing to me is, is he did that in the ninth century. He was a Persian scientist, astronomer, and mathematician, yeah. Abdullah Muhammad bin Musa al um, often yeah. cited as the father of algebra, but was indirectly responsible for the creation of the term algorithm. But now, um, you know, my, my, my first base hit was to become a dentist, and writing that way was awesome. Then 94 to 98, I saw this internet taking off, and we did Dental Town, and that was kind of a second base. But now it looks like third base is all going to be artificial intelligence, and it's all going to be um, it's all going to be these algorithms yeah. and these young yeah. kids that are studying how to program in Python. They're not even finishing their diploma, and they're getting hand hunted out for a hundred grand a year from Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Qualcomm. I mean, uh, so it's just so amazing that that guy's work in 900 yeah. AD is finally coming to change the entire <laughs> world. Um, so yeah. I, I love the fact that, um, you know, there's 10 specialties recognized by the ADA and everybody wants to talk about orthodontics and oral surgeon and pediatric dentist. They, they want to talk about everything but public health. And yeah. we are mostly treated. What, what percent of what the 2 million dentists on earth do? What percent of it 
could have been prevented through what you're trying to teach these kids? In my opinion and my personal opinion, I would say 60 to 70% could be prevented, right? Yeah. It's the same number as you would say. And, and that's why my friends in China, when I lectured in Shenzhen, they're like, uh, they morally did not believe in dental insurance because they thought it was, um, it was subsidizing bad behavior. And they said, you know, if you want to drink Coca-Cola and eat chocolate bars all day, well, when you have a toothache, you should pay for that because you used your money to buy Coke and chocolate and now you're going to pay the piper. It's kind of like, you know, that the people have the money to spend seven bucks a day on a pack of cigarettes from age 16 to 76. But then when they get lung cancer, uh, they want someone else to pay for their $100,000 yeah, uh, yeah. deal. And that's where insurance can really pervert incentives and make a moral hazard. Because if you bought all your cigarettes for 40 years, you should at least pay a 10% copayment for the hundred. What? Why does your neighbor who's a yoga instructor, who's right now eating celery with, uh, with chickpeas, um, why does she have to pay more taxes to pay for your lung cancer or dental decay when you're yeah. spending your own money on chocolate and cigarettes? So it, it's uh, managing humans is the hardest thing anyone will figure out. So where does this it's passion come difficult. from? Where, where does this passion in you come from? Where, where did, how did you become a dentist in Cairo and just fall into public health? So I went through dental school and I finished dental school, very excited to go into clinical practice like everyone. And I uh, put a lot of time and effort to gain all my clinical experience. And then one thing happened. I joined an, uh, a training program. It's, uh, it's called a preceptorship program at UCLA in uh, California. This is where I got to see actually the first dent. For me, it was the first time to see the dental public health work that I always studied as theoretical knowledge coming into practice. It was one of the programs that is, uh, um, I think, funded and supervised by the team in the Department of Pediatric Dentistry and Dental Public Health. I was uh, there under uh, Dr. Francisco Ramos Gomez. And uh, this is where I actually saw how in one unit of time that you can fill a tooth or do an endo, you can actually promote oral health and do motivational interviewing and do the camera and the caries risk assessment for 10 people, 20 people. And I was really amazed to see how life changing this specialty can be and how much time I spent actually learning it from books, not from real life experience. And since then I've been hooked to this kind of work. I wanted to be on the ground trying to reach out to people. After that, I came back to Cairo to start work on my master's degree. Uh, so it was a master's degree in dental public health. And my clinical work was to be in the outpatient clinic in one of Cairo's largest hospitals. So uh, I was uh, meeting hundreds of patients every day, uh, diagnosing my share, uh, trying to talk to them, explain where the disease comes from, uh, what is decay, uh, I had to adjust my way of telling the story to their different backgrounds, to their different uh, knowledge that already existed. So many things I learned while doing this. So when it was time for my master's degree research, I uh, went to, uh, to, to uh, study the difference in efficiency between different education methods for school children. And this is when I went further into uh, public speaking for children and how to maintain their, uh, their interest and how to grab their attention for the longest period of time possible. And how do I get them to fill a 12 questions questionnaire while they're thinking about going to play outside or, or finding something interesting to do? Like everything that I had to do, it had to take the form of something interesting for children or for the audience who's listening. So time after time and project after project, I found myself being dragged into dental public health specifically the oral health education and promotion part, because I really see how life-changing it is. Lately, I've, I started uh, reading about the origin of preventive dentistry and uh, why is treatment, why, why are we always talking about treatment in dentistry? Prevention, it, does exi it exists, of course, and people do a lot of prevention, and there is beautiful work being done everywhere in the world. But... I, I, I stumbled uh, upon two of the fathers of dentistry, uh, J.D. Black 
and uh, Pierre Fouchard. So they both gave us a lot of the dentistry that we actually practice today. All of the dentists everywhere around the world, a lot of the instruments surprisingly haven't changed. So a hundred years ago and even more, they both put the basics for dentistry practice for every dentist in the world. And then at some point at their career, they both started to advocate on how we shouldn't eat a lot of sugar and how we shouldn't practice a lot of habits. Exactly as you were saying now, this, this opinion that you heard in, in China, uh, they both started to talk about this. And then J.V. Black spent the last few years of his life actually practice, uh, researching this strange condition of mottled enamel that actually with time, I, I think it was with McCain, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. With the time, this turned out to give us our most useful weapon against dental decay. And now we use fluoride. So both of the fathers of dentistry created treatment, and then they worked on prevention. And yet until 2019 today, treatment is leading the way and prevention is following. Why is that? While every logical way of looking at the disease, it says, I mean, we're not going to go back to prevention is better than cure, right? We all know this. This is not new for anyone. But why is that that every, uh, uh, every logical way of approaching a disease says that the best thing to do is not to have the disease in the first place? Then why are we all waiting for the disease to happen and then to treat it? It's, it's as simple as that. And this is what I always have in my mind now. Even while practicing dentistry in Egypt, I found that I spend so much time actually doing patient education while working because I feel that this is what will make the treatment more valuable. This is what will make the treatment more sustainable. This is the actual service that the patient can get from me as a dentist. So I don't know, the passion started with the first time I saw dental public health being practiced and then it just kept on improving and kept on, and on evolving until it took the shape of no dental. Well, it's exciting times because if you take the 8 billion humans on earth and let's say that it spends a dollar educating the humans. Well, you know, when you're in class lecturing at this current model where, you know, one teacher, 28 students and kids like me, when they were lecturing in grammar school, I'm just sitting there daydreaming about fishing and catching frogs. And, yeah. <laughs> and now it's going to go to a smartphone. So the lessons yep. will be customized. They won't be talking to you when you're daydreaming about butterflies and, and you yep. know, and so, so the lessons will be 10 times bigger, better, but the cost will be one tenth. Well, that, that's two decimal Absolutely. places. That, that, that's scaling education a hundred years. I've always said, and I'm sticking to my guns, that, that humanity's finest century started in 2007 with the invention of sticking the computer into the cell phone, and that from 2007 to 2107 will be mankind's greatest century. Everybody thinks the last century was great with all the uh, uh, Niels Bohr and all the electronics and going to the moon. It's, it, this is going to dwarf it. So do you, um, um, and what, how old's your daughter? My daughter is two years old. What a lucky little girl to have you as a dad. I, you, oh, can just, you. you can just tell that you're so into this. So what do you think it's going to take to connect to a child to make them realize that they have self-mastery, that they shouldn't be hoping for a cure for lung cancer. They should just not smoke. They shouldn't be hoping that the government pays for free root canals. They should, they, they can learn how to not have a root canal. How, what, what do you think connects them? Is it, is it storytelling like Disney, like Mickey Mouse, Goofy, Donald Duck, and SpongeBob? Is it the science? What, 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 do, you, what do you think uh, uh, in first grade, six years old, what, what do you think makes them sit up and pay attention to you? Okay, I, I will answer this question and I will do my best to not get very technical. But we just have to keep in mind that it's always a game of motivation. What's in it for me? This is my opinion and this is how it's done and this is what I learned from different ways of, of, of reaching people. It's always about motivation. So how do I motivate a two years old? That's really difficult. How to motivate the more reasonable age of four to six years old, 10 years old. It's really different. And it's not only related to the age. It's related also to the background, to the education, to the where is the child on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? in which kind of family and, and um, 
and the socioeconomic uh, group was he born was she born it's very important to talk, take all this into consideration how are there are are the children's parents already talking to them what is the way of talking at home how do they take orders do they take their opinion there are so many things to consider before trying to send the message to a child and hoping that he will accept it but to generalize this to start from the beginning first of all we want to engage as many senses as we want so so for example you have the small uh, you have the small sample that i sent you a while ago would you like to uh, would you like to take are a look at that are you talking about now? this yes i'm talking about the kd sinna flat can, can I ask one question before you go on yeah. to this? You, you talked Please, about, ahead. you know, um, you sound like an economist when you said it's all about motivation, what's in it for me. People follow their own self-interest. I mean, you know, from an ant to a grasshopper to a human, the only reason that ant's walking across that field is because he thinks he's going to see a resource to eat. But what about yeah. the opposite? What about negative motivation? Do children respond to the fear of a cavity or losing their tooth? Is, is it all positive motivation or are you also using uh fear the greeks said that we had two emotions uh fear and greed and and stock market shows that fear is a bigger emotion than greed because the 10 biggest plummets are yep. far greater than the 10 biggest gains and if you're sitting in a tree and you're really thirsty and you see that lake with water and you want to drink so bad but you see three crocodiles sitting there looking at you uh, then the fear says, I'm not drinking. So do, do kids yeah, respond probably more not to fe drink, no. fear or positive motivation or, or they respond more to fear? I honestly don't have the answer to that. I only have my, uh, my uh, the, the way I try to deal with that is we will all face the negative things in our lives, right? Even those children and grown ups, everyone is going to face this. I wouldn't like to be responsible of this negative experience. I would like to associate everything beautiful about keeping healthy teeth and mouth with everything positive in the situation. So honestly speaking, I've, I've never tried this kind of motivation that if you won't eat, if you won't brush or if you eat incorrectly or the sweets, you will get the cavity and look how it's going to be. And I've never tried this honestly. And I know a lot of people who do this, but I, I don't like it. I don't like it. So you I, like I prefer positive. to, I like positive in general. And yeah, the reason yeah. why I sound like an economist is that surprisingly, a lot of this behavioral change models and the things that I actually uh, uh, had to read a lot about to be able to come up with these uh, things that I do, they actually come from economic, economic research and the, 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 uh, all the kind of marketing and advertising research that started in the time of the World War II, right? With the mass production and how to reach the public yeah, I've always, oh, yeah. I've always thought the greatest economists were the ones that knew mankind, the homo sapien, the animal, the best. Yeah. And Absolutely. whether it was um, Maslow, um, you, 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 you quoted um, Abraham Maslow. Uh, yeah. my, my, my favorite was uh, Desmond Morris. But between Desmond okay. Morris and Abraham Maslow, you said, okay, we're homo sapiens and we're the last reigning homo. I mean, there's no more homo neanderthal, denosovan, homo erectus. Nope. We're the last homo. And we won. You, you, yeah, we won, we won the homo race. And homo yeah. in Latin is means mankind. And yeah. homo in Greek means same. So a lot of people think homo is homosexual, same sex, marriage, whatever. But it's, um, it's mankind, and, which I think yeah. solves the, the pronoun issue. Because you, can't, you don't want to write he, she, he, she, him, her. You know, you always have to, um, you know, if you just say homo, Yep. Uh, I, I, in fact, when I say, you know, my homies, they don't realize that in my mind, I'm thinking my homos. Uh, but if I say my homos, they're all going to say, hey, I'm not, I'm not a Greek, same sex. I'm a, but it's mankind. And, uh, like my species or something. Yeah. It's my species. Yeah. And there's yeah. 8 billion individual homo sapien organisms. We got one species, one tribe, and they love the taste of sweets. And who wants to, I mean, every animal on earth, there's 15 million species of, of yep. life on earth and every one of them only drinks water except us. And, Absolutely. and, and I, I get it. I mean, I know why you want to drink a Dr. Pepper and eat a Butterfinger instead of a glass of water and celery it with even pumice. figured out a way to put some air into the water and drink it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so these, uh, I, I, so are you a pediatric dentist by training? Uh, so my training was in pediatric dentistry, but my master's degree is in dental public health. 
So um, I focused in pediatric dentistry as clinical training, but I don't say that I'm a pediatric dentist because of I don't know. It's the lawyers. It's, this is how it's written. So the lawyers, you can say that. Well, I, I think it's, I, I think all pediatric dentists to me are special because for, I mean, I have four boys. They made five grandchildren. I love kids, but I don't like yeah. to work on them. And I remember one time I was uh, doing this uh, charity mission deal in, um, in Mexico and these, uh, all these kids were crying and screaming. There was this little boy from AT still, he was just smiling. And I walked up to him and I said, dude, trust me. Trust me, you need to be a pediatric dentist because you're you're completely <laughs> wired different than every dentist down here. You either Absolutely. got it or you don't got it. And he Absolutely. And, <laughs> and I said, You you just got it. And uh so um so so um let's talk about this kit. Do you now do you have a, a JPEG or an image of this box that you can send me? Uh yeah, I can do this. I yeah, can yeah. Do this. send me the picture. I love the box. Um it's um, um it's called the KT. Senna flat? KD Senna flat, yes. Okay, start so with is, that. What does that mean? What does KD Senna flat mean? There is a story about this name. So I was thinking of naming it uh, like uh, something deviated from cavity or decay or something more catchy than this. And then I went to Ikea and I realized that I don't understand a single word of what is being said, but I know the names of the products and they are in a different language. The language of the place where this is came from. And I fell in love with the idea. So I said, why not this product that I have really big ambitions for it because of its efficiency so far in my experience, why not this product would actually carry the name of a tooth in Egyptian Arabic? So Sinna is tooth in Egyptian Arabic and KD is no dental and flat is because among all our games and tools, this is the flattest game and tool that we have. Everything is more uh, three-dimensional and uh, different in shape and size. Okay, so I gotta I gotta um, repeat all that. So, Senna means tooth in Egyptian Arabic. Yes. Okay. And then, um, what did flat mean? Of all our games and tools, this is the flattest game and tool that we use. Everything else is like the KD Senna medium that you saw in the article. It's a huge three-dimensional model, for example. Everything is three-dimensional. Flat is representing two-dimensional, more or less. Okay, and KD, where, what did that mean? That's no dental. Oh, KD is no dental, duh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, so actually, actually, I, I saw that you opened it from the above here, from up here yes so okay can you put it back in again yes how, how many ways were there to open the box i'm just wondering how many how many just, uh, the, just the right way and then the other way from so, opening so there's only above. so there's only two ways to open it and i i mastered the wrong way right from the start <laughs> that's the story of my life okay so okay, okay so so you follow on the side here yes exactly so first of all, there is a small hole here. Just a second, just a second. Okay. So if you put your fingers in the hole here, you will be able to pull the gloves out, but you already pulled them out. Okay, well, yeah. now, I, now I pull them out. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yes, so I now, reloaded it. So now you wear the gloves. Okay. I hope they're the right size. Um, you know, I'm only 5'7", so I... Uh... Medium is my size, but if I'm doing something where I have to feel like a root canal, I, yeah. I, I wear small. Yeah. Um, okay, so okay. I got the gloves. Yes. And then you can start opening, you start tearing the, the, yes, from the side here. Yeah. So just follow, just follow this. Yeah. So the, the printing house. Oh, I see. It goes all the way yeah. down. Yeah, the printing house could change their blades. I will insist that they do this next time. <laughs> yeah, where did you have it printed at? I have this printed in Egypt. Well, the um, I printed a magazine, um, you know, 150,000 Dental Town magazines a month since oh. 99, and the best printing houses with the highest tech are always by the forest, and you're oh, up yeah? there in Canada. So. Oh. Because when you buy a printing machine, it's five million yeah. bucks, and you got to run it twenty four hours a day for about three or four years till you throw it away. 
yeah, and they yeah. don't want to move the logs a thousand miles. So they want to cut down the tree and stick it right in the machine. Put it in. So yeah. the best printers are right by you. Between Toronto oh. and uh, Wisconsin is oh. all the best printers. Uh, so I yeah. didn't know this. I yeah. definitely consider this. So whenever you find a printer like here in Arizona where it's in the middle of the desert and there's no trees, it's always really high cost, really low efficiency, really low tech. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, That's interesting. In fact... Uh, in fact, a lot of them are disappearing. I mean, China will come over and buy the uh, the printing company and then disassemble the entire factory and move it to a force in Canada because they know they're not going to reinvent the wheel with that. Yeah. It's already, okay, so now it's open. Okay, so, so this is a small example on how I would like to explain how dental decay happens in a session given to many children using it at the same time or in a dental office when I, I, the dentist or the dental hygienist or the person responsible for dental health education will do this to the child. So this is how it works. I uh, uploaded two pictures on Dental Town. You have access to those two pictures, right? Right. So I always found that when dentists are trying to explain dental decay to children specifically, you go either in, uh, you go to one, uh, you go to one of two ways usually. The first way is to talk about the worms and the bugs that live in your teeth and mouth. This uh, story is actually, it originates from thousands of years BC, actually, and it still remains today being taught in places. And then there is the other story of bacteria and fermentation and acid. And the problem with this story is that when you start telling it, the patient starts looking elsewhere and he's starting to think about what he's going to have for lunch and when the freezing is going to go away, right? Right. So it's always challenging to talk about this. So I started thinking how to engage as many senses as possible. So on the picture, the one with the fermentation picture, you will see different foods when it's left in water or saliva in your mouth, it changes. We can do nothing. We can do nothing about this. This is what usually happens. And then it produces when it changes, it produces what we call the acid or the evil juice. Or so I will just change the name of the thing, uh, depending on who's listening. So this evil juice. Now, if you go to the other image, it's the evil juice in the tube, the green one. Now this evil juice, if you hold the tooth and put it on the shadow on the base of the box here, now open the box. Yes. Put it on the base of the box. Yes. So the, Exactly. There is a shadow. No, just put the box on the table. Okay. Oh, so the I box see. is made. Yeah, the box is made to be a protective shield, so not nothing is going to happen underneath. Okay. So the the tooth is placed on the shadow, right? Mm -hmm. Can you place it on the shadow? Yes. And then in in the same box, you're going to find two plastic uh, containers. One is green and one is red. Yeah. Absolutely. Now let's start with the green because on the, in the picture, the evil juice or the acid was green in color, right? So we got this evil juice that came out from the fermentation of whatever that wasn't washed that you left in your mouth. And when we put this acid on the surface of the tooth, can you open this container now mm -hmm. and spill it on the crown of the tooth? Try to spill it in the center. I'm going to move it off my computer because yeah, I don't and, trust myself. And absolutely. And, uh, and try to keep it as flat as possible on the, on the table. Okay. And why, why was green the evil color of photosynthesis? I'm just curious why, how, uh, I got, don't know. how green uh, got to be evil. I mean, I'm all for uh, it. I look at, uh, I look at ponds of water and I see algae and I don't know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful photosynthesis color, but at the same time, usually fermentation is associated with green, right? This is yeah. what you get on your bread. Yeah. Yeah. Mold. Uh, it oh, was, okay. this, this came from my experience. Nothing scientific about it. And what's the red called? Just evil juice as well. To represent oh, red it. and green are both evil juice. Oh, yeah. okay. There's two yeah. colors of evil, red and green. Yeah. Okay. So when you put the acid on the tooth, did you see what happened? Did you see the reaction that happened? The fermentation, the, sorry, the effervescence that happened? Yeah, the foaming. The foaming, yeah. The fermentation. So, so if you hold one of the pieces of the gauze in the box, and then 
There were two pieces of gauze, yeah. Right. One of them, and try to wipe the surface of this uh, effervescence, this place where the reaction happened. Try to wipe it off? Yeah, wipe it, wipe it really like... Oh, it's all get smudgy? Piece. Exactly. So, you created a small hole on the tooth surface, right? Yes. Yeah, so now, if you hold the other plastic container... The red. The red one. Okay. And then you open it. Okay. And then you spill it at the same spot, on the same spot again. Okay. So even more reaction is happening. So every time you leave food in your mouth, this acid is formed. It starts to eat up the surface of the tooth. And then if you wipe it again, try to wipe it with the other piece of gauze again. Wipe it really well. Mm -hmm. Now you have a cavity, actually. You should be starting to see black color now. I am seeing black color now. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what happens. The cavity doesn't happen from the first time. A cavity happens from the repeated acid attack. This is what you just did with your own hand. Now, everything that you just used is house. Uh, everything is a household product. Everything is safe. The gloves are only to keep your uh, your hands clean and just for more suspense for children. They would feel they're doing a science experiment. Also, I get goggles for them, but you're wearing glasses, so that's good. So it smells and, like uh, it smells like vinegar. There you go. It's Everything vinegar. is household items. Yeah. So, so the uh, red and green are both vinegar and dye. It's acid-base reaction. As simple as it can be, this is actually what happens in our mouths on the surface of our teeth, and we just don't see this happening, of course, because it's amplified and fast forwarded like a thousand times. But this is what happens basically. So I was able to tell the story of dental decay without going to bugs and worms. And at the same time, without losing the interest of the children, they feel that they made, they had some science going on. And then after that, I turned the box to the back. And then when it's a big group, or just a child, one child, I ask them, all of these things are good things to do. So what would you like to do? What would you choose from here that you think you're able to commit to that will keep your teeth and mouth healthy? And it's four things. It's visit your dentist regularly, choose yeah. healthy food, brush yeah. your teeth two times every day yeah. at least, and drinkless juice and soda. Yeah. But that's basically it. Of course, there are a million other uh, advice that we can give. But basically, that's how simple it can be for children, right? Yes. Um, yeah, that is, uh, that is amazing. I, I never have seen drinkless juice and soda. I always hear, don't I drink mean... juice and soda. <laughs> but drinkless juice and soda, was that, was that trying to make it more succinct? Or where did, where did that come from? No, it's just uh, the printing house that was very good. They just had to put a space here. <laughs> so it turned out to be something interesting instead. I, I like drinkless juice, so. juice and soda. Be because what I do with my grandchildren is uh, just um, when they yeah. want to get a Dr. Pepper or whatever, I, you know, uh, I'd say, to, well, if you could be one animal, when you grow up, if you, could, if you had to be another animal, what would it be? And it's always going to be okay. a lion, a tiger, uh, yeah. an eagle, yeah. and I'll say, okay, so you want to grow up and be a really strong tiger? What do tigers drink? Do they drink Kool-Aid? What's the only thing a tiger drinks? Water. So if you really want to be big and strong and grow up like a strong tiger, well, then only drink what tigers drink, and that's only water. And That's um, a beautiful way of expressing it to a child. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then choose healthy food. That, that's what I tell my kids all the time. I just, you know, like... Um, my uh, my oldest, my, my granddaughter, I got four grandkids, five grandkids, one of them's a girl, and she said, uh, you know, she, she heard about vegans. And she okay. said, you know, should we be vegan? I say, well, there's uh, 5,000 different types of animals, and every single one of them eats other animals. So do you <laughs> want to be the only animal on earth that doesn't eat another animal? <laughs> Why? I would rather follow what Bambi, Thumper, and lions and tigers and alligators. Uh, and and uh, so I, I always tell them, I say, 
If you only eat plants and animals, you're going to be fine. And if you have to read the label on the box, there's no label on a cow, no. a chicken, a fish, no. a vegetable. If you have to read a label, then you don't need to read the label. You just don't eat it. If it has a label exactly. on it, a label <laughs> means don't eat it. You know, yeah. and I said, yeah. hey, it's just salespeople trying to convince you to give them their money to eat something that's not good for you. Just eat stuff without a label and you'll grow up to be strong like a tiger. Um, so on the first one, visit your dentist regularly. I noticed that the, pedi the, the pediatric dentist, when I got to school in 87, they were always trying to court the dentist to refer to him. But the dentist would always wait till some child that got scared and crying and then they'd send him somebody. And the pediatric dentist figured out in the 80s that you don't want to get them from dentists. You want to skip the general dentist, go right to the pediatrician and try to get that pediatrician to refer them to you at, at one or two years old uh, before yeah. they've had any bad experience. So um, I, I noticed the pediatric dentist, that they, they don't even, that most of them don't even like referrals from general dentists. They only court wine and dine pediatricians um, so how, um, at what age, when you're talking to kids, does visit your dentist regularly already scare them or where they're still young and haven't seen anything negative and like, oh, I want to see the dentist. So it starts to make sense for children to use such games and uh, tools as we call them when they're at least four or five years old. This is when we start like building some logic in the conversation, in my experience. So um, by that time, they probably have visited their dentist. That's for sure. For usually for uh, treatment, uh, the lucky ones are the ones who know that they had to go there just to uh, get to meet him and know the place. But it's definitely recommended now that children would really have to go early to meet the dentist, get all the, the, the information that they need to keep their healthy teeth. And for the parents as well, it's the, the concept of the dental home and uh, actually what you were talking about, what you just mentioned now, it's a, I don't want to call it a trend, but it's, it's a new way of seeing uh, dentistry for children that a lot of preventive work is being uh, delegated uh, step by step to different uh, health care provision uh, professions like uh, nurses and general physicians. They, we like, they are starting to have a role in directing the child to his dentist or pediatric dentist because we really want to start the, 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 the teaching and start the education before the disease happens, before the negative experience happens, which is very positive. This is a, a great direction. And I see all this work in oral health education and promotion and creating those games and tools. This is really complementary to any treatment that will be done one day. So... Um. Uh, so yeah, this is what we're in now. I want to hear your, um, did you ever hear the story? Did you ever watch the uh, Blues Clues? You might have missed that because your daughter's only two, but about 10, oh. when, when, when my, my boys are 24, 26, 28, and 30, when they were little, there was this show called Blues Clues, and I watched it like a million times because they, they loved it, and it was just this kid who could just connect with kids. I mean, he just had that special. So I want to hear your amazing mind. I'm looking at this picture how the cavity happens, and I see like a black bug plus, um, walk through that graphic. I, I wanna see what your mind is seeing and what you're trying to get a kid to visualize. So go through that picture. So, so it's difficult to explain bacteria if you didn't study bacteria in science class yet, right? So it's something really small that exists everywhere and I chose this kind of, sh this shape, this black shape, with the help of a really talented designer in Egypt, uh, to try to express any kind of uh, creature that the person who's using this poster is going to refer back to. If you want to stick with the bugs or worms way of telling the story, no problem, here is your creature. If you want to try to explain bacteria, here is a bacteria, like, like a neutral shape, more or less. And then the shape after that, it's the candy, uh, this is like the basic shape of candy, right? Uh, candy in its foil. So if you eat candy and you have this creature that's bacteria, usually what you get is this juice, this acid. You will get to choose what you name it. And then you spill it on the tooth surface. If you brush it right away, everything's fine, nothing happens. 
if you don't brush it and if you leave it there, you'll get the cavity that's going to happen exactly as you saw in the game now. And this game is one of many games that we use. We have other games that are not science experiments, other games like the one in the article on my LinkedIn account. It's actually a competitive game. Children are, uh, are packed in groups and they are competing against each other on how to brush this giant tooth. It's a beautiful transition between you have to keep the tooth clean and then this is how you hold the toothbrush and this is th those are the brushing movements. It's a transition between like this is the concept, let's play, let's know that this is the right thing to do and then after that we're going to discuss the rotation or the or the just brushing or uh, the, you have to reach everywhere in your mouth anything that you're going to say is going to be built on a positive experience of the children already playing with this game so different games and tools that are designed to be used in different scenarios with different oral health promoters using them uh, just to engage as many senses as possible and to get the children to make this face of wow this is the first time i see this and sometimes even to get adults to say in all my years of going to have my teeth fixed i've never understood how this disease happens do you know it's a great feeling when this happens because you feel like you change this person way of seeing the issue right very very neat uh, and that um that germ thing i mean um it was um they weren't even discovered till 1665 by uh, Robert Hooke and Antonio Van Leeuwenhoek. Um, but before 1865, they, they didn't even know these existed. And yeah, um, yeah. so, um, so yeah, so that little kid doesn't have a chance. Um, <laughs> no. at, at what age do you think they understand um, microorganisms? I start talking about microorganisms uh, at around six years old. Sometimes it's, uh, it's okay sometimes it's still too early but even at this age if I find that uh, they don't know what I'm talking about then it's okay they will learn it soon enough but so the concept is there already you know yeah um, yeah. yeah it's um they got to learn I mean there's six kingdoms animal plant fungi protista archaea and eubacteria uh, we learned it uh eubacteria was uh, prokaryotic and archaea was eukaryotic, but I guess now they uh, decided that wasn't going to work. So now it's a archaea and um, eubacteria. Uh, yeah. Whenever you hear somebody say um, prokaryote and eukaryote, you know they probably uh, are senile and have uh, clogged arteries in their brain. Uh, so, um, and what's what's amazing is we had Rella Christian on this show, who has a PhD in microbiology. And she's yep. a registered hygienist, and she's married to um, Gordon Christian. And I, I always say she's the brains behind the operation. But she was telling me on this show that they're discovering a new oral species every three months. Wow. So every year they find four more. And what's really weird is that when you look at a cavity, which, you know, I was trained, you know, it was streptococcus mutans, that by the time you're four millimeters deep into a cavity, there aren't even any more streptococcus mutans. Yeah. And then the yeah. weird thing that was a couple of years ago is how fungi are a big part of this, that the bacteria fermenting couldn't do their job unless yeah. the fungi were helping them. So it is eukaryotes. Uh, and if you're on Snapchat and Instagram and want to call it a eubacteria, uh, whatever, it's a eukaryote or eubacteria, <laughs> archaea uh, for eukaryotes and fungi. So they're, they're all involved. I wonder, yeah. um, I wonder if they've linked uh, uh, protista and fungi to uh, a traditional human cavity yet. Do you know about that? Have they nope. done that? No, I don't. I don't know. I don't know, honestly, but I, I find it really amazing because these creatures, we, we live together and uh, we don't know they exist. And then suddenly they exist. And then suddenly they explain a mystery. One of the very famous stories is the, the, the peptic ulcer story and the helicobacter pylori story. This is amazing. Like mm -hmm. unbelievable how far, uh, how far we had to go to actually discover that this is related to this. Right. Right. Um, so um, you, I got turned on to you and called you to come on the show when um, after I was on LinkedIn, and I want to thank the uh, forty thousand dentists who follow me on LinkedIn. That is amazing. And by the way, if you're wondering what's the difference between Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, I'll tell you real quick. 
LinkedIn is all the people that make all the stuff that make us look good. Like you, like say, say, say you like digital radiography. Well, the people who make digital radiography, they're not on a Facebook dental group. They're, they're on LinkedIn and the LinkedIn people are all the ones making all the stuff, which is why I called it dental town and not dentist town. Because I, <laughs> I because if all the dentists were, were complaining that this, this stuff was too thick and it needed to be thinner. Well, the, if the manufacturers don't know, it's not going to change. And yep. Twitter is for everyone who's old. Instagram's for everyone that's young. But you published <laughs> on Twitter, uh, think ancient Egyptian sculpturing skills used in oral health education by Dr. Kareem Abdul El Monte. Uh, nope. um, <laughs> and it was, nope. it was just an amazing um, article. T talk about that article. In fact, I posted it on Dental Town under Egypt. Uh, so we have an international, we have 50 forms, one's international. I post that under, um, it says, Dr. Kareem Amofti, the founder of No Dental and author of this article, has experience in training more than 3,000 adults and children on oral health and hygiene to date. He was on the team that broke the Guinness World Record for largest oral hygiene session in Egypt in 2015. Um, tell us what made you write that article and what, what the takeaways are. So the challenge with dental public health and community outreach with and oral health promotion and all what's related to these fields is usually the sustainability of the effort done. There's a beautiful work that's being done everywhere in the world now. On LinkedIn, I got connected with people from uh, Poland, Sweden, uh, Egypt, India, uh, Australia, and everywhere in the world there are beautiful uh, different kinds of work that are being done. Giants, giant companies are sponsoring research, sponsoring those groups, maybe uh, medium-sized groups and nonprofit organizations, and even single dentists, they just leave their clinics sometimes and they go somewhere to do oral health education. And it's always the challenge of how can I be interesting and how can I give uh, my audience the ability to actually choose uh, and to actually understand and change their habits and then the other challenge is how much money should I put in it? Because it has to be sustainable at some point. It, it, it can't be dependent on the goodwill of the person doing it. Right. Right. So, so the reason why I started uh, publishing this article is that I found that the KD Senna medium is one of our games and tools. Uh, so again, quickly, it's uh, if you read the article, you'll get all the details. And if you even want to reproduce it and do it yourself, no problem. If you want to contact me and I can ship it to you to try it, it's done from very basic material. It's a very primitive game. It was very popular in every place that I went to with No Dental Ambassadors, every place that we went to as a team. We uh, played the KD Senna Medium. It was the most amazing game that the children have played. So I thought of writing this article, first of all, to put this kind of work out there. Uh, I'm really passionate about this work, as you know by far by now. I would like to connect with all the people out there who are trying to do this. And I would like to take my experience in this field with no dental to actually provide them with different solutions. So different, uh, like integrated solutions. For example, if you're a school and you want to outsource this oral health education work, there is a company specialized in oral health education. You can call them and you tell them, come do the oral health education to my school. If you are a dental office, and you feel like you, if you just graduated and you're starting your practice, if you have own a dental office, it's been years since you've been working, you want to uh, do your marketing in the way that, uh, that transmits your image to your patients, right? So what do you want this image to be? You want to be, I think that every dentist wants to be the dentist who takes care of his patients, uh, the dentist where at his office, you get to learn a lot on how to protect your teeth, how to protect yourself, how to take care of the fillings you just had. This is a very positive image that can be used in marketing for dental offices. And then during the dental appointment, how do you do your oral health education? Do you talk to the patient in the treatment time that is very valuable to you? And at the same time, the patient is very, uh, is really thinking about leaving this room right now <laughs> because that's, that's enough for today. I'm not going to learn how to brush my teeth now or why to do this now. So it, it seems that this is not the right time to do this. So when is the right time? We need something to fill this gap here. 
uh, to be able to provide more value to our treatment and to our patients. So again, going back to the article, I am trying to put all this experience that I have, that many people have around the world. I wish it can be commoditized as much as dentistry is being commoditized these days, right? Dentistry is going in a direction of being commoditized. So usually what comes after commoditization, it's differentiation. We want to be different. We want to be known by providing something to do something. So, so this is it. This is what no dental is about. This is why this article was written. And, uh, it's, it's, it's meant to connect all the people with the same interest together, make it even more reachable and make it possible to do with people who want to do it and maybe don't have the means or, or don't have the skills to go talk to a young audience so they can learn this, they can use the games and tools, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting. Uh, I, I found it. How, how was yeah. your response to that article on LinkedIn? So uh, uh, people found it was interesting. It reached you. I am here on this interview with you, and I'm very happy and honored to be here because of this article. Uh, a lot of people sent questions. Um, I didn't get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, requests to create it and ship it, for example. But it's understandable because it's something. It's a new concept. Like, what is this? It's a game used for oral health education. But why would I want to do this? I'm doing everything the old way and it's working fine. But is it really working fine? Um, well, I, w- I want to ask you, I, I want to go right to the most um, controversial thing in pediatric dentistry. Uh, you, a lot of the older pediatric dentists don't have much use for silver diamine fluoride. A lot of the younger, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, they're like, um, yes, it, it's the way, you know, prevent, prevent, prevent. Some of them think um, it's a jade, that healthcare is jaded because like, like, like when I got my MBA at Arizona State University, I was sitting in there with um, people that, that worked in hospitals. They say, look, man, with Medicaid, Medicare, we lose money on all the exams and x-rays. We, we lose money, but, but if we do one of the big surgeries where we get $100,000, like a, like a, like a cabbage, a, coronary artery bypass graft or a colonoscopy or, you know, some major surgery, as long as, you know, we get paid 60 to a hundred thousand dollars for these big surgeries, as long as we get three or four a day, we can run everything at a loss. And I just sit there and thought, man, what a messed up healthcare system where you got to carve someone open and do a bypass or remove a foot of their colon or give them a double mastectomy uh, to pay all your bills. And so the the problem again with insurance is it's perverse incentives. Like, like I sat down with my insurance company all the time and I said, look, I don't need a thousand dollars to pull four wisdom teeth in a, in an hour appointment where I'm going to use, you know, four or five carpules of uh, septicane and, and reusable elevators, but I'm losing my butt on cleanings, exams, x-rays, and fillings. Can you give me more money on cleanings, exams, x-rays, filling? And I don't need a thousand dollars for a root canal, a crown, a partial, a denture, but Absolutely. it's like all the big money is surgery. Like if you're not doing extractions and molar root canals, um, yeah. you're, you're out of your mind. I mean, you're not going to make a living uh, doing uh, recalls. If that was true, then you would see a bunch of dentists who had five hygienists that all day long, eight times a day, they were doing a cleaning exam and, and, and uh, you know, and you, you lose money on that. And every dentist who tells me his hygiene department is profitable. Oh, oh yeah. There's one small uh, nuance that they can't show me the math. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll be on like Dentrix or Eagle Soft or Open Dental, but their accounting will be on Quicken. And guess what? Those two things aren't connected. So they, yeah. so rule number one, they never know their numbers. When a dentist is telling you their numbers, um, you need to be um, just, uh, you know, try not to roll your eyes to where they, they can see you, but know <laughs> that, you know, you're, 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 you're talking to uh, someone who does know their numbers. So, um, so what do you think of silver diamine fluoride? I would like to comment on the, on the first part of what you just said, uh, Dr. Howard, that, uh, so I, I always say that I dream of a world where oral health care providers are being reimbursed for keeping their patients healthy, not only for treating the disease. So I used to say this, and then my uh, friends and everybody who's listening would say, oh, so you want to change the world? Uh, yes, yeah, 
I, I don't mind trying and doing my best. And why does this sound crazy? Because doesn't it make sense? Like, why do I have to wait for the disease to happen? And then I will get reimbursed the big amount of money for the tertiary prevention when I can actually go into primary and secondary prevention and all parties are happy. Like imagine the insurance company uh, have some rules or regulations to uh, the, the, you will not get this uh, policy or this insurance for your group or your corporate or your or thousand employees unless they have this training on how to take care of their health. I'm sure someone did this in the world right now, but how efficient is this? We have so much to learn from the training industry. The training industry is a multi-billion dollar industry targeted mainly, as I have learned, to corporates and to talk about more efficiency and more communication skills and time management and how to master yourself and your, your motives, et cetera, et cetera. We have so much to learn from this industry that is growing in an amazing rate every year. Why not we're approach why aren't we approaching healthcare training and education the same way those extremely talented trainers and coaches everywhere in the world are approaching different areas of life? So this is one thing. Now going back to silver diamine fluoride, for example, um, I, I I don't want to go into a lot of details because I'm not really into practice here in North America. I'm still working on my license. However, the, what I know about silver diamine fluoride is it's it's a great thing. A lot of research is being done. Great results are happening. But is it really how this is the way how to prevent the disease? Because it, it doesn't work that way. We're, the disease is happening. We're trying to prevent the flare and the more complications by just putting the bullet, the silver diamine fluoride, and just stopping the progress for now. How long will it remain stopped? And if the patient doesn't know that he has to brush his teeth, when is he going to get sick again and the disease is going to start again, et cetera, et cetera. There, there may be answers to this, but this is the thing about oral health education. If we think about it in a logical, in our flawed, biased logic, you will not know how to brush your teeth unless someone taught you how to brush your teeth. That's very basic. We can disagree on that. But if we, went to, if we want to put oral health education into research, and I mean rigorous research that will measure and give me numbers, it's really tricky because me knowing something, I can measure this. How well did I know it? But does this mean that I am going to actually do it? I can also measure this. Measure this. Now, if I did and practiced what I learned, did it actually prevent the disease from happening? So you are talking about three different things that have to be measured. Two of them are dependent on extreme discipline of doing the same good habit every day. And who of us does the same right thing every day, right? We're, we're, we're human. Now, this is one thing talking about oral health and hygiene and food from all the, multi, the, the, the other factors and the multifactorial disease that is dental decay. And then dental decay, it takes time to happen. So it's really tricky to research the efficiency of an oral health education method while applying a certain treatment to stop the disease. It's, it's much shorter, right? It's a shortcut. But here I am thinking with what I'm doing of another shortcut. Can, is there another shortcut through those three steps of knowing something and then applying it? And then will it actually prevent the disease or not? Can there be a shortcut of getting people really interested and really internally motivated to join the trend? Like, let me, let me explain more what I'm trying to say. Nobody convinced me or probably convinced you one day to wear a tie while going to a formal meeting. This is just how it's done, right? While the story of the tie, it goes back in history to something that doesn't really represent anything of our formal meetings now. So we, we didn't need any explanation for this. It's just the trend. This is how it's done. So can oral health education using the new marketing methods and using all different kinds of science behind motivation and behavioral change, can it actually one day make oral hygiene and oral health related habits good ones just a second nature to people without having to go into all the details in between? I hope so. I hope so.
So uh, the the origin of the tie, um, 17th century, during the 30-year war in France, King Louis VIII hired Croatian mercenaries who wore a piece of cloth around their neck as part of the uniform. And yep. so now the, the everybody I know, when I see someone wearing a tie, um, they, they are their economic mercenaries. When, was, when I see someone wearing a tie, I hide my wallet. Uh, I know oh, somebody's okay. uh, going to use words. Uh, to create emotions to make me uh, a fool and their money will always be so, parted. So that's, that's classic conditioning and it's one of the tools that I am ha happy to use in this field as well. <laughs> so so what is the, uh, so what, what's next? What, what's your future? How can my homies listening to you right now, how can they, they help you on your mission? So I am really passionate of what I'm doing and I am working now with the uh, Toronto's dental anesthesia coach, uh, Dr. Khaled Khaled, who is, has the similar vision about prevention. What's so his he name? Khaled, C-A-L-I-D. Yeah, yeah. Khaled Sharif. No, no, Khaled Khaled. Khaled, how do you spell? So C-A-L-I-D. No, K-H-A-L-E-D. K-H-A-L-I-D. No, L-E-D. L-E-D. Yeah. And his last name? His name, same as first name, Khaled Khaled. Well, that's that's nice and tidy. <laughs> and easy. <laughs> yeah, so he's a dentist in Canada or Toronto? Yeah, Mississauga. Yeah, Mississauga. He's a specialist in dental anesthesiology. So he did a lot of work to fix children's teeth under general anesthesia. And then we were talking together, and then we could really relate to the actual value of the treatment when it's offered to a patient and then the patient doesn't know how to take care of the treatment that he just received it's it's uh, there is no there are no words to say about how this logic works like you're going to fix teeth it's going to cost you or cost the government or cost your insurance or someone is paying a lot of money for this and then how are you going to take care of this if you don't know how so i'm working with him now to try to figure out like a solution for an integrated solution for the dental practice to put oral health education in a very interesting way in a very pla well planned way in every step along the way the patient since the patient starts hearing about the dental office until he comes in your waiting area and then goes into your operatory or the working room and then after he leaves there has to be oral health education messages that will fit every patient correctly in this path because this is the value that we want to add. So this is one thing that I'm working on now. The other thing is I, I would really like to put this into research, the efficiency calculated in numbers of what I've been seeing progressing. Like children are usually very happy. I'm still in contact with people I visited in, in Egyptian deserts two years ago, and they're saying that the children still remember the games that we played with, but I don't have any numbers yet. I'm still in the, in the area of edutainment, education and entertainment. But I can't go say, uh, this is going to prevent dental decay from happening. I would like to do some research, and I'm actually applying in, a, uh, in, in the programs here in Toronto and in Canada, to get into the research community and to get to test this uh, educational tools and get more numbers out of them to be able to actually tell an insurance company, for example, one day, if you use this, you have a chance of, I don't know what percent that the disease won't happen and this will save you, et cetera, et cetera. Like going back to the logic that you mentioned earlier. So this is another thing that I'm doing. So right now I have my Facebook page, it's no dental and Instagram page, also no dental. And then my uh, personal account on LinkedIn, Karim El Mufti. Um, everyone who's listening to this and who's interested in this field, uh, please follow us and join our small communities. Uh, very soon the website is going to be on, uh, up and running and, uh, we'll probably be starting with small consultations like what I'm doing now and then taking it step by step into commoditization to be able to actually give this educational tool to every dentist who wants to practice this because it's, it's really important. There are no words to express how important this is as complementing treatment. Well, I wish you would make a, um, an online CE course for pediatric dentistry. Um, you know, when, when you come out of school, $285,000 in student loans, 
a three thousand dollar weekend course where you got to fly across the country is out, out of the ballpark. Our courses are eighteen bucks. They've been viewed almost a million times because millennials wow. on Instagram and Snapchat, uh, and uh, or um, you know, it's just the price is right. Um, when uh, yeah. you know, when you um, say you bacteria instead of uh, uh, eukaryotes uh, and prokaryotes, they, they they don't have the money. So if you did your demonstration or or, or, or filmed it live in a classroom, um, February in America is uh, Children's Dental Health Month. And Crust, okay. usually, if you contact Crust, they, they give you a bunch of kits. So you can go into any any second grade class and give them a kit. And, you know, I love doing it. It's exhausting. Uh, I, I feel <laughs> sorry for teachers because I'll go in there on a Tuesday and do like five or six different classes at five or six different grammar schools. And then you get home at four, five o'clock and you just fall asleep for the night. And it's you, like, usually with a headache, right? <laughs> oh, my God. It's just so exhausting. And 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 um, so they, they do it with the second graders. But you, you should make a... a, a presentation of how you're no, doing it with of the course. kit and send me a, a JPEG and how to order that kit. Your website, um, we're going to delay this podcast. So your website is up. Uh, so we're not okay. going to release it until um, it's up and your website's going to be no dental dot C a. Yeah. Yeah. No dental dot C a. Um, have you thought so all- I'm going to have, I'm going to have an online store there to order these uh, games and tools, these different games and tools. I'm still working. I'm still transitioning into mass production and, and branding because until now I've been still in research and development. Uh, but I really think these things are ready now. I mean, you tried the sample. I think it's ready to be used, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, like I say, I, I w- get a better cutter. That would be nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, I mean, that would be, um, you know, I think that crisp peeling it open would, um, would, oh, yeah. um, would, would be Absolutely. a hot thing. Uh, but man, I, I, I love what you do for dentistry. I mean, that's what I love about dentistry. My, my kids used to always tell me this all the time when they were growing up. They said, dad, your dentist friends are really, really cool. And I said, well, think about it. They went to college <laughs> for eight years to work with their hands, to do hands-on surgery, to get other people they don't even know out of pain. I said, it's, yeah. it's a special guy. And and in my experience, um, some of the other professions attract a lot of weirdos. I mean, I don't want to get into politics, <laughs> but um, it seems like <laughs> if you tell me you want to be the governor, I already know something's wrong with you. It's like, <laughs> what made you want to go into politics? Just, just saying you want to be a politician. It's like, wow, I wonder what went wrong in their childhood. Uh, <laughs> but, but dentists, on the other hand, I mean, they're all surgeons who try to help their fellow human beings. I I, I just yeah. love them. And, and my yeah. boys notice it at a very age. And man, I just love you. I love what you're doing. I love your oh, mission. You. Uh, I wanted to immediately We're, get you on the show and do anything I can to help you. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very, uh, I would be very happy, of course, to join any of these ongoing efforts, learn from them. Maybe I would have something to add to them. Uh, so I would be very interested to join another thing that we're doing actually, and I think it could be of value, but it's very, it's still very more difficult to actually, uh, commoditize is that the team, the no dental ambassadors, they don't have to be dentists. So I found this very interesting because, uh, a lot of people from different fields, they want to do volunteer work. So you end up going to a food bank, you end up going to, I don't know, whatever you do, but you don't put any, uh, you don't put a lot of, uh, of skills into that. You're just volunteering your time. Now, what uh, I've been doing with No Dental is to prepare some kind of training and curriculum for anyone from any different background to be able to supervise and to work in this oral health education session. He's not going to be an oral health promoter. That's a different career with different background and everything and a, l- a lot of things to study for that. But he will be able to do the job in this a lot of time for it. So giving a lot of uh, space for volunteers to do different things. It's very useful when you're approaching uh, remote communities, when you are the outsider. It's not easy to be able to tell and to educate what you know. So you will just use this curriculum to train people from this community to be able to do oral health education for their own community. And you will be just standing on the side, providing the tools. So that's another thing that I'm working on. 
So, uh, so yeah, it's a beautiful field. It's, uh, I understand you have a story with dental public health as well, right? With fluoridation of water in, uh, in, in, in the area of Phoenix, correct? That's yeah, I mean, I, I got to Phoenix, Arizona in, uh, in um, 1987. And to tell you how um, ignorant I was, I, I, when I was in dental school, I was in Kansas City, and one of the hardest requirements to fill was our pulpotomies on kids. And every okay. Tuesday, they would bring in this bus filled with uh, two-year-old kids from the poorest economic areas of Kansas City. And you would yeah. just sit there, and you'd say, do you have a toothbrush now? How often do you brush your teeth? I don't know. And you take bite wing x-rays, no cavities. I mean, it was just, it was so, so rare. And then I moved out to uh, Phoenix, Arizona and the area I, um, um, the, the downtown Kansas City is mostly African-American and I'm out here in Phoenix and my practice, I'd say it was only about, you know, maybe 15%. So it was mostly Hispanic, Native American, Indian and European descendant. And they just needed pulpotomies right and left. So yeah. I finally called the director of, uh, I called the Centers for Disease Control and they said, well, just, just talk to uh, Jack Dillenberg. He was the, uh, the dentist and the head of the Office of Oral Health. And I said, what is it with, with Europeans and Hispanics and Native American Indians? Um, why do they need all these decay? I mean, I never saw this in downtown Kansas City that was mostly African American. He goes, yeah. Howard, it's not race, it's water fluoridation. And then, so I, so then I went to, uh, um, I went to, um, the um oh what's a, the 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 website um NIH or whatever um and, and I started reading fluoride studies and I, I think I read all five thousand summaries on uh and wow. I realized that it was just depressing. It's like, well, I'm not gonna sit here and drill, fill, and bill yep. 40 hours yeah. a week from 25 to 65 when Phoenix doesn't have fluoride in the water. So I told my yep. team we are gonna we're gonna block off Fridays. And every Friday, there's only one mayor and eight city councilmen, and we're going to go be in their face because it makes no sense to me to do this uh, on an assembly line, which which, yeah. which could massively be stopped. And uh, so that was my roots in public health. And, and knowing and, and my work in preventing decay gave our team so much more purpose. I, I think that's why so many of them stayed with me 20, 30 years is because they had purpose. They weren't going in there saying, oh, let's let's try to do $5,000 in root canals today on two-year-olds. It's like, well, what kind of a weird goal is that? But having the purpose and going to the city council and telling them, and, and um, man, I pulled it off. And when it got to the vote, what I did is I knew it wasn't gonna pass. So I brought my mask, my gloves, my loops and my syringe and I sit there and said, you know, you know, do you want to, do you want to do the, do you want to do my job? And I loaded the <laughs> syringe and I, and I walked by yeah. every one of them with this syringe and say, do you want to stick this in the mouth of a two year old and do a root canal? I don't. And it's my job. And then the mayor finally said, put the cap back on that needle and go back to your podium. I don't want <laughs> to see that ever again. And then they voted and it was eight to one and oh uh, they passed it. And um, yeah, the Centers for Disease Control sent me and Jack Dillenberg a letter saying that their epidemiological model thought that it would prevent 800,000 cavities a year. And so then I was and, like, and dude. that's you. Yeah, and that's like, you. It's like, dude, yeah. I, I'm done. I'm a dentist and yeah. I was done. I think I was, Got out of school at 24. I think I was 27 and I thought, I'm done. Everything <laughs> now is just extra. It's about preventing yep. disease. Treat exactly. every major religion only has one sentence in common. They don't have a name of a person, a city, a place. The only thing every major religion has in common is treat other people like you want to be treated. And it's so identical. It almost looks like plagiarism. And it's like, exactly. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be treated for a root canal and lung cancer. I, I want it prevented. And guys like you who are so young, you're still bright eyed and bushy tailed. You're not jaded yet. You know, you haven't, the system hasn't overran you to where you're not happy anymore. You're still pursuing happiness. You're not living in fear. Thank you for all that you do for dentistry. And if there's anything me and my homies can do, uh, just post it on dental town and we're, we're going to help you. I'll definitely do this. It was very, very nice being here today and talking to you, uh, Dr. Howard. I'm looking at the time now and where, where did the sour go? So uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure. And you tell that little girl of yours when she grows up that I called it first. She's the luckiest little girl in Canada to have a dad like you. you. Have a great thank day. Thank you very much. Thank you. You too. Thank you.